Right, so since we did do a, a tech field day not too long ago, I'm gonna focus more on just, uh, just a quick introduction to Isilon. And what we wanna focus on today is really about the new platforms that we launched and very specifically the F800 or the all flash version. So a uh, quick introduction, I'll do that and then I'm gonna hand it over to my engineering counterparts and they'll go through the actual hardware architecture the 1FS enhancements to address and, and to, to enable Flash, as well as some of the actual real-world performance that we see with the platform. So to start it off, oh, and I, and I will say that uh, I will be available for later today for offline discussion as well as at our dinner. So if you have more in-depth questions that you have about things that we don't cover here, I'm available at that time. So to start things off, uh, Isilon is the scale out NAS leader. And we've been doing that for over 15 years. When in some sense we kind of defined and really built out this category of NAS storage. And it's no surprise then that we are recognized as the number one uh, scale out NAS leader in the market. We see this also validated in the market. And take care of your computer. <laughs> we see that customers, we, for instance, we've shipped over 3.2 exabytes of capacity in 2016 alone. And we have over 8,000 customers running their business on uh, Isilon. And this is because Isilon delivers a lot of value to the customers. And just to give you some context, uh, Isilon started in 2001 really focused on uh, a, a media need for streaming data, being able to stream lots of content and finding a way to do that better with storage. And so a lot of our uh, customers actually use Isilon for their line of business or their R&D and the core business applications, as well as general IT. So in, for those type of workloads, customers are looking for performance, capacity, and scale. At the same time, they, because they run their businesses on, on Isilon, such as media editing or streaming content or designing new chips, they also need enterprise-grade capabilities to protect that data because it is so critical. Uh, last year, we also extended the capabilities to seamlessly integrate with cloud. So very similar to for the, the Unity team, we have a way to tier content off to a cloud for us for, uh, uh, to, to go even larger capacities and, and uh, to provide additional roadmap for what you can do with the cloud. You can also do data analytics straight off of the Isilon cluster. So in other words, you could do, for instance, Hadoop analytics and point a Hadoop cluster to the Isilon cluster without having to pull data off and ingest it in there. At the same time, Isilon, because of its heterogeneous clusters, the fact that you can mix and match different types of storage, different tiers of storage, in a single cluster allows you to optimize your TCO and store data on the most appropriate class of storage. Now, this is all possible because of Isilon's platforms and 1FS, which is our operating system and file system. So the, with the combination of two, and again, I'll just briefly touch upon this, with the combination of the two, you get that single scalable file system. And this scales from tens of terabytes to tens of petabytes. Now you can also uh, partition that logically if you want, but, from, uh, but we do have customers, for instance, who actually are using the largest clusters that we can support and running entire data sets and workloads on uh, the one of us. All the nodes are fully, the, the whole cluster is fully symmetric and it's a clustered architecture. So each of the nodes in the cluster provide both the data as well as the IO, uh, IO services uh, for, for, all the, uh, for all the certain workloads. We are a true multi-protocol data link. And I point that out because I think in, you know, scale out has expanded. We have a lot of, there are a lot of uh, storage vendors that say that they're scaled out. But one of the things about the multi-protocol aspect is that you can really write via any of the protocols that you see listed here and read back out through any of those protocols. So you can store your data once, let's say you have a workflow that comes in through a legacy application, write it in through FTP, NFS, SMB, then you can still use that data uh, through any of the newer protocols like HDFS and uh, Swift. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the ability to actually build clusters and the single file system with a mix of different types of nodes. So we have nodes that are, let's say, more performance or, uh, optimized, others on the other end that are more capacity optimized. And you can mix and match these and use our policy-based tiering to move the data transparently between the different tiers of storage in that cluster. And this is all transparent to 
the end users because we move the data, but through, but as they access it, they still see those the data in that file system. With that same technology, you also get the ability to non-destructively upgrade your clusters because you can upgrade a single node, and while the data is still accessible through the other nodes in the cluster, you can even also uh, detect refreshes non-destructively. So we've had for, you know, I believe for the 15 years that we've been uh, designing Isilon, the ability to, to avoid any kind of forklift upgrades uh, with our clusters. Now as we think about where our customers were headed, this is something we started looking at a couple of years ago. We saw that the industries that we're uh, quite often playing in have some challenges that really challenge what storage needs to deliver. And so they, they tend to push on the performance and capacity requirements of storage. And these are just some of the highlights, right? So an EDA going to smaller geometries, even going 3D and stacking them, which is really increasing uh, the amount of uh, the, the designs and the amount of data that they need to process and crunch. Uh, life sciences, when you get to population scale genomics, uh, as an example, you need about 80 petabytes of data stored for every million people you want to sequence. Now, if you want to do that at nationwide scales, right, think about how much data you now need to store. M&E, the transitions from HD content to 4K content, it was doubling in a sense of resolution, but it was actually quadrupling the amount of data that you need to now store and process uh, in your workloads. And enterprises are looking for big data analytics and now even looking towards real-time and streaming analytics to, to get uh, data and insights quicker. So we see this kind of pushing on, the, again, the performance and the capacities needed uh, for, from storage. So we actually went, kind of went back to the drawing board and said, OK, if we want to enable all this for our customers, what do we need to do? <coughs> and what we did was we actually just and this, we just released this, uh, uh, launched this a month ago, which is our new generation of platforms. And takes the whole node concept that you have, the four nodes that you saw there, packs it into a single 4U chassis. So this is a new dense and modular architecture and design that you're going to see in all of our platforms and all the different tiers of storage that we sell uh, going forward. So this applies to the all flash version that we're going to talk about today as well as the other spinning disk versions that, are, that give different mixes of performance and capacity. So to give you some examples of what this scalability delivers for you, uh, when you think about capacities, a 4U chassis with four nodes can be as small as 72 terabytes raw, uh, and as large as 924 ter uh, terabytes in a 4U. Yes, I know it's, it seems mind-boggling that you'd actually want almost a petabyte of raw capacity in a 4U chassis. We actually have customers demanding that today. Uh, so, uh, so now this is raw in a 4U chassis. You can, we start with 75% usable. So you actually get quite a lot of usable space to begin with. You said you have customers that want um, that kind of capacity in 4U. Yes. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what kind of applications those customers are running? Because that is an awful lot of capacity. <laughs> So, uh, so if you think about, for instance, as I mentioned, the population scale genomics, that's a lot of data. Now, not all, not all the research organizations have all the money to actually buy this kind of flash-based capacities. But we do have another example where in the automotive space, for instance, we've had customers who would ask, hey, we need to store, store tens of thousands of hours of video data for cars that have, you know, the, to, to record where they're going on the roads, and then they use that to train their mm -hmm. Uh, auto, uh, autonomous vehicle algorithms. Machine learning. Machine yeah. learning, right? Yeah, so, so, so machine learning training is one of the big applications. Video-based, for yeah. instance. Yes. Yeah. The reason I ask is this has been a, a kind of a, a question that I've had. There's a few solutions that are similar to this that pack a lot of high I.O. NAS storage in a small footprint. And so the question was, you know, sort of uh, what, are, what are companies developing these solutions for? And I suspected that it was machine learning. But... Uh, are there any other other examples of what people are using it for? So that's the that's the one that, that's one of the biggest ones exactly. we see right now, right now. But what I will say that as I looked as I look across different industries, actually, video is actually becoming more widely used. So we see it in autonomous vehicles. We see it in life sciences research imaging. They're actually using 4K video uh, to, to watch uh, some of the organizations organisms organisms. Uh, and so there, so we, we do see video driving <coughs> a lot of the data growth. Like Matt's music library. That's 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, and I think that uh, I've seen some uh, uh, Netflix uh, <laughs> home video libraries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you can put a rack in your in your home. And exactly, my daughter's that. collection of kids shows could probably fit on that. Yeah. And so if you actually scaled out to the maximum cluster size of 144 nodes, uh, today this would scale to 33 petabytes in a single cluster. And this is actually something we are going to continue to improve upon and allow customers to scale even farther and even larger. When you think about performance, we look at the all-flash version, for instance. You can get 250,000 file IOPS, and think of it in terms of namespace and read and write operations intermixed. So 250,000 file IOPS in a single chassis, 15 gigabytes per second of aggregate read throughput, all this in a 4U. And again, scale it out. And the nice thing about Isilon is it scales linearly. And we've, we can see that that would scale to 9 million file IOPS in 540 gigabytes per second. So to give you a comparison point, right, to our current or our previous generation of platforms, and the, the S210 is the highest uh, provides the most file IOPS and the smallest uh, rack space. And you would basically be taking 12 of those 24 rack units and, com and basically squeezing it down into a 4U package. Right? So this is the amount of, like this, this gives you an example of how much performance we've now packed into uh, the rack units uh, and the rack space for our customers. And if we compare it to some of our closest competitors, we still have tremendous performance and capacities at scale uh, that we can achieve. All right, so that's a very quick overview. Again, I'll be available later if you want to dig into anything else about Iceland, but at this point, I'll turn it over to Steve.